Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for Speaking of Schools, a conversation about voucher laws across the United States. I'm Sharon Kirsch. I'm co-founder and executive director of Save Our Schools Arizona Network, and we are a statewide grassroots organization, and we are dedicated to research, community engagement, voter outreach around the importance of supporting public education. And I'm really excited today, this is the third in our series of Speaking of Schools, to introduce our panelist, Jessica Levin, who's a senior attorney at the Education Law Center and the director of Public Funds Public Schools, and Catherine Dunn, who's the regional policy analyst and child's right, child rights advocate for the Southern Poverty Law Center. So welcome you both, and thank you so much for being here today we really really appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to spend this hour with us and thank you to everybody in our audience for joining us so for those of you who are on facebook live you will be able to post questions in the comments as we're talking and uh, the save our schools arizona network team members who are behind the scenes will feed those questions to us We'll try to get to as many of those questions as time allows. So I'd like to start with Jessica. Those of us, um, those who across the United States are working to privatize public education have thousands, dozens and dozens of think tanks and policy analysts and lawyers and websites and they self commission studies and they have billion dollar backers like the Koch brothers and U.S. Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. And in Arizona, we know very well because we have our own branch of the Americans for Prosperity and DeVos's American Federation for Children. We also have the Goldwater Institute. All of these organizations that are working to pull public tax dollars out of our public schools and put them into private voucher schemes. So Jessica, could you tell us a little bit about what prompted the campaign, public funds, public schools, and why, why there are so few organizations like this. And tell us a little bit about how this got started and, and what Public Funds for Public Schools does. Yes, and thanks so much, Sharon, and to Save Our Schools Arizona for inviting us to be part of this amazing program. Uh, we closely follow your work and the work of everyone in Arizona who is fighting to keep public funding in public schools. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Public Funds Public Schools or PFPF campaign. Uh, it's a national campaign to ensure that public funds for education are used to maintain, support, and strengthen public schools, and that they're not diverted to private school vouchers or other private educational uses. And PFPS is a collaboration of a few organizations, Education Law Center, where I work, um, Southern Poverty Law Center and the SPLC Action Fund, and the law firm Munger, Tolls, and Olson. And our goal is to ensure that students can attend a thriving public school that has the resources to meet their needs and welcomes them free from discrimination. We're using many strategies to do that, including litigation, policy work, and research, and we can talk some more about that. Um, but for how we got started and what was our motivation, as you mentioned, there are many well-funded, well-resourced pro-voucher groups, for example, the Institute for Justice, IJ, or the American Legislative Exchange Council, known as ALEC, um, groups that are pushing for voucherization. And our individual organizations had been fighting vouchers for many years, um, but we've teamed up now to ramp that up and to counter those efforts with a robust, sustained response, because we think that kind of sustained response is needed in the face of many, many organizations that are trying to promote vouchers. So there are, of course, other fantastic groups, including SOS Arizona, fighting vouchers. And one of our key goals is to support and collaborate with other groups. But we also wanted to increase capacity where it was needed, for example, through litigation to fight vouchers in court. Um, so I know that many of your viewers probably already know a lot about vouchers. Just for everyone, I want to tell you a, a few of the key reasons that PFPS opposes vouchers. And the first is that they redirect scarce public funds to private educational uses, which significantly undermines the ability of public schools, which serve the vast majority of American students. It undermines their ability to serve all students and ensure that they have an adequate 
and equitable educational opportunity. Many public schools were already struggling before this year with underfunding, with severe and chronic underfunding, um, stretching back to the Great Recession and even further. Uh, and those, the need for resources and the budget cuts that will be connected to the pandemic are only gonna exacerbate that situation. So we can't afford um, to send those scarce public dollars to private education uses. Additionally, many of the legal rights and protections that apply to students in public schools don't apply to students using vouchers to go to private schools. So students can face discrimination in admissions or once they're in a private school with a voucher. And this includes the fact that voucher programs often don't prohibit discrimination based on religion or based on LGBTQ status or that English language learners or students with disabilities often have to give up many of their rights when they take a voucher and go to private school. Um, and families are often not told about that. Um, additionally, vouchers can exacerbate segregation in schools. And one study found, for example, that voucher programs are more likely to increase school segregation than to promote integration. And finally, I just want to note that studies also show vouchers don't improve academic achievement. In fact, several studies have found that students attending private schools with vouchers have poorer academic outcomes than their peers in public schools. Um, and there's a lack of financial accountability, academic accountability, and transparency with vouchers. And I know that um, that has been shown in Arizona specifically. Um, so for all these reasons, because vouchers are poor public policy and they can be illegal in many ways, we're committed to fighting those programs and keeping public funds in public schools. So we're happy to talk about any of those strategies we're using, but that's a little overview of why we're doing this work, why we think it's so important. That's excellent. And I just have to say from Save Our Schools perspective, as we've sort of come to learn about all of this stuff and trying to sort of kind of find resources and keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening, it's been absolutely fabulous to have public funds, public schools, and your great website doing so much of that work for us. So we are really grateful for that. So I know that many, many of our Save Our Schools Arizona volunteers are well aware of vouchers. Um, and have worked with us to stop or at least slow voucher expansion. Uh, but we also know that Arizona is not the only state facing these issues or these efforts to try to privatize public education. So Catherine, would you tell us a little bit about um, other voucher programs in other states, kind of what that looks like nationally across the US? Sure, and I just want to echo Jessica's thanks for having us um, as part of your webinar series um, and for all the work you do and um, the work that your supporters do um, as well to um, protect public education and improve it in Arizona. Um, so I think uh, to talk about like the state of voucher programs across the country, it's important to um, look at the history of private school vouchers and their origins. Um, so the first kind of wave of private school vouchers in the country came after the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. Um, and were really concentrated in southern, southern communities who used vouchers as a tool to evade desegregation. Um, southern states offered these vouchers to incentivize white students to leave desegregated public schools. Um, in some of the states where we work um, at SPLC, Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, tens of thousands of students um, left their public schools to attend segregation academies in the years following Brown. Um, and these diversions of public funds were, um, you know, direct response of white communities to desegregation requirements. And some states like Louisiana offered actually more um, and private school vouchers than they paid um, for public school students to attend public schools. Um, and white flight from public schools actually also impeded um, districts' ability to raise funds. Um, property owners uh, were less willing to raise taxes to support schools um, in this kind of dueling system environment. Um, so while this era of vouchers were eventually struck down post-Brown, um, over the past couple of decades, we've seen vouchers um, reemerge in new forms and expand, but often around narratives of, of failing public schools that really remain systematically underfunded. Um, and important to note that that underfunding really targets um, black and brown schools across the country in particular. So right now we have about 30 states with some type of voucher program, um, whether it's a traditional voucher program that directly funds 
um, students to attend private schools or a new form of voucher. We, we continue to see kind of new and creative ways emerge like tax credit scholarships that fund vouchers through intermediary organizations or education savings account vouchers. And I know we'll get into some of the weeds on the different forms of vouchers. Um, PFPS considers all of these diversions of public funds to private schools to be vouchers. Um, but Florida is one example of, of these 30 states of a state with um, several types of voucher programs. So it has two vouchers for students with disabilities, a tax credit program, and a program for specifically for students who say that they were bullied at school. Um, and a new program passed in 2019 that uses more of a traditional voucher structure to funnel even more money away from public schools to private school tuition. So when you take the sum of all these programs, Florida is actually diverting um, over a billion dollars a year um, from public schools and public services to private schools. Um, and as a result, it now ranks 41st out of 50 um, states in the nation in funding fairness of public schools. Other states, of course, devote um, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, Indiana and Ohio and Wisconsin, and of course, um, in Arizona, um, states being some of the, the top um, uh, diverters of public funds to vouchers. Um, so while, while the landscape is that we do have um, voucher programs in a majority of states, um, dozens of state legislatures each year, last year and this year, um, take up voucher bills the vast majority of which do not pass. Um, the most recent new voucher programs to pass were um, in Tennessee and the one I mentioned in Florida. Um, but dozens and dozens of voucher proposals are, are not successful each year. Um, the 2020 legislative sessions in particular because of COVID are, are still wrapping up, but um, it, it looks like we will have similar results in that way as we did in 2019. So advocates, of course, you know, continue to make headway at rolling back voucher programs across the country, um, including through lit litigation. And the PFPS team has challenged voucher programs in Nevada back in 2016 and Tennessee this year that were both struck down um, by courts before their implementation. Um, it also includes organizing and advocacy. And of course, you all in, in Arizona have really held the line on stopping voucher expansion um, after voters overwhelmingly rejected expansion in 2017 um, in subsequent legislative sessions. Um, so we, we continue to see um, uh, legislative advocacy be successful as well. And, and we'll talk a little more about some of those trends. Awesome. And would you say a little bit about, so the Nevada case, um, the Nevada vouchers would have been, had that actually been funded, the first universal voucher program in the United States. Can you say a little bit about why that never happened, either one of you? Sure. Um, so that was a great victory for those fighting to keep public funds in public schools, because as you say, Sharon, that would have been a universal uh, voucher program. That was an education savings account voucher program. Um, and that program was challenged by Education Law Center and Munger, Tolles, and Olson and others um, under uh, Nevada's education clause of the Nevada state constitution, uh, which says uh, that um, the legislature has to fund uh, public education first and fund it in an amount that it deems adequate. And because the money for that universal voucher program was going to be taken from the allocation that had been made to fund the public schools, uh, it was unconstitutional under the state constitution. And it was struck down ultimately by the Nevada Supreme Court. Um, and so it never got implemented. The money never flowed out to that program, um, which was very important, especially because Nevada's um, public schools are some of the most underfunded in the country. Yeah. Thank you. So, Jessica, say a little bit more about, you talked about public funds, public schools. I think our Facebook Live um, stream may not have been running when you defined it. So you maybe would just give a quick definition of what that campaign is and where it, it came from. And then talk a little bit about some of the trends that you see in terms of voucher bills and what, um, advocates for public education can look for in the coming year or just in the future in terms of um, what, what we might expect with voucher legislation. Sure, just for, so for anybody who wasn't here at the very beginning, um, public funds, public schools, 
PFPS is our national campaign of Education Law Center, Southern Poverty Law Center, and the SPLC Action Fund, and the law firm Munger, Tolls, and Olson to fight private school vouchers and other diversions of public funds to private education uses. So to keep public funds in public schools um, because they voucher programs drain scarce resources away from public schools and because um, voucher schools often can discriminate against students, vouchers can increase segregation for all of those reasons um, is why we're doing this work. And you asked about um, trends in vouchers. So uh, let me point to a few different things that public education advocates can look out for and that we've seen in previous years. Um, as Catherine said, vouchers, the, the way that vouchers are funded has changed and evolved over the years and what vouchers are called has changed and evolved over the years. But the bottom line is that all these programs are vouchers that take public money away from public schools. So there's traditional vouchers that pay for tuition at private schools. There's education savings account vouchers like you have in um, Arizona and many other places um, where part of the public money that, for example, part of the per pupil amount that would have gone to public education is deposited into a personal account that um, parents can use to pay for private school, but also importantly for a lot of other private school expenses like transportation or books or sometimes homeschooling. Um, so Arizona adopted ESA vouchers early on. They're increasingly popular. That's the type of voucher that was seen in Nevada or in Tennessee passed last year and now stopped right now by the courts. Um, and voucher proponents are pushing the idea of ESAs during the pandemic. For example, the Heritage Foundation has recently suggested putting education funding toward ESAs. So this is one to, to know about and look out for. And actually Public Funds Public Schools just did a webinar on ESA vouchers that will be up on our website. Um, there are also tax credit vouchers. So that's another um, form of vouchers that has now been around for a while. And um, there are some tax credit vouchers in Arizona as well. Um, and this is when individuals or corporations can get up to 100% dollar for dollar credit to send the money that would otherwise have gone into taxes that would have gone into the public treasury to pay for things like public schools. It's instead given to a what's called a scholarship granting organization and then they give vouchers to families to pay for private school. Um, and finally, another trend I want to mention is that there's a push to expand the use of 529 accounts, which you might know as college savings accounts, to expand their allowable uses to K through 12 private education expenses. Um, and Arizona is one of the states that is now allowing that. So as those types of programs expand, um, more money is flowing to private education uses. So those are different types of vouchers. It's also a common strategy to start out with a small voucher program targeted to a specific student population, such as students with disabilities, and then continually try to expand the students who are eligible with the end goal of a universal voucher program. Um, and that strategy is also illustrated in Arizona's ESA program. Um, so frequently targeted groups of students are students with disabilities, low income students, students who are in so-called failing schools, um, and more recently, as Catherine mentioned, we've seen the rise of proposals for child safety or bullying vouchers for students who say they were bullied in school. Um, as Catherine said, most of these voucher pro programs aren't successful, um, but that's because we know what to look out for and we have to continually understand how vouchers are shifting and evolving and, and what the new proposals are. Um, one more important point that I want to make, so it's not all vouchers uh, expanding, is that um, Arizona isn't just an example of, of how vouchers can programs can grow. It also demonstrates how excellent advocacy can halt and roll back voucher programs. So um, as Catherine was mentioning, SOS Arizona's work to spearhead the ballot referendum that halted what would have been a very large expansion of Arizona's ESA program. Um, and other advocacy that you all and others have done in Arizona. For example, last year, um, other voucher bills either didn't pass out of committees but weren't taken up by the full legislature or those bills didn't advance. Um, so, and you know, more activity this session, but there are a lot of voucher bills that haven't moved too far in Arizona and elsewhere. So um, these are the, the bright spots in the strategy to look at that there's a lot of success in fighting voucher expansion as well. Thank you. And we did uh, two in the 2019 legislative session. There was one of a bullying bill very similar to the one that Florida has that didn't make it out of committee here. 
Um, and like you said, I think one of the things that has been really um, disheartening for us to see in Arizona as our public schools are struggling so much to watch these voucher programs expand and expand and expand. When ours started, it was just this really small $1.5 million a year for very few number of kids who have very high special needs. And then it's just grown exponentially since then as our public schools have increasingly faced um, a really, really terrible crisis. And we know that our teachers are buying their own supplies. And, and um, so it's been frustrating. And I think that's something that's motivated a lot of our volunteers is really wanting our state to recognize and prioritize our public schools. So it's definitely a tactic to get in there with that, yeah. um, with that, you know, small program and, and some will even build in automatic expansions year after year. So mm -hmm. um, they don't even have to take legislative action each year for all of a sudden in 10 years, it to be a much larger program. Um, so. Yep. Yes. So we spend most of our time paying attention to the state of Arizona and what's going on in other states. But Catherine, could you talk a little bit about what's going on at the federal level? especially now with the COVID relief efforts and the CARES Act, which is the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act that has provided some funding to states. Tell us a little bit about what's happening at the federal level with vouchers. Sure. And currently, um, there is only one um, federal uh, voucher program, meaning um, passed through federal legislation, and it's for Washington, D.C., um, and there is, um, you know, some decent research on this program, um, meaning valid research, um, showing that the program does not improve student achievement or other measures like parent satisfaction, um, and so I know there's continued advocacy to address the Washington, D.C. program, but um, Sharon, as you said, our current Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, is a longtime proponent of vouchers. Um, and seeks to, to change the federal landscape to expand it um, around vouchers. And so during her time as Secretary of Education, she's um, pushed several voucher pro uh, programs at the, at the federal level, and, and we've seen her um, use language uh, like education freedom in, in those efforts, um, which mirrors you know, the segregationists that I spoke about earlier who pushed kind of our first wave of vouchers because um, they didn't always explicitly talk about their racist motivations behind vouchers following Brown, but instead spoke about freedom to choose um, their schools. And we've seen President Trump, too, in um, his State of the Union address refer to public schools as government schools. And so I think, um, you know, there's a lot of dangerous language around um, public schools and what it means to establish these kinds of vouchers um, coming from um, this administration. But um, there is a proposal in both uh, chambers in, of Congress to pass what is called the Education Freedom Scholarships and Opportunity Act. It's a $5 billion um, federal tax credit voucher pr um, plan. Um, there have been proposals for education savings account, ESA vouchers, specifically for children of military families and other voucher bills. And none of these have seen much activity in Congress beyond um, introduction. But um, in the midst of uh, Trump uh, promoting vouchers a good bit over the past week, um, Senator Cruz, who has sponsored uh, this um, education freedom voucher in the Senate, has renewed calls for a hearing um, on that voucher. Uh, it remains to be seen if, if support in Congress um, will change, but it does not appear that um, there is Democratic support for the vouchers. And of course, um, Betsy DeVos is a pretty unpopular Secretary of Education, um, and there's been a lot of really great advocacy, um, like your advocacy in Arizona, um, that I think has kind of changed the conversation around um, uh, vouchers and their harm um, uh, to public education. But DeVos is not um, necessarily stopped by um, the lack of support in Congress. She's now using um, some of the federal stimulus uh, packages that have passed to provide relief, federal emergency relief to schools and districts um, across the country um, following uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, and following all of the school closures that resulted. Um, and so she has um, done a couple of things to advance her privatization agenda under um, the, the CARES Act package. Um, one is she's established a, a grant program for states to apply to receive um, funds from a $180 million pot 
um, to set up micro grant vouchers, which really are structured like education savings account vouchers. Um, and those um, applications are, are open. It remains to be seen um, which states will ultimately apply or be awarded, um, but it's something to be watching for um, in, in your state advocacy um, wherever um, you are. Um, she has also um, uh, released guidance for districts um, to uh, require that, to try to require um, that they um, divert, uh, that they provide uh, private schools with um, a greater share of the CARES Act funds than is required um, under law or allowed under law. Um, these are Title I funds that are uh, intended for uh, low-income students in public school districts, um, and DeVos um, is, is encouraging um, states to follow her guidance, suggesting that pr they should share these funds with private schools based on private schools' total population. So um, the, uh, public schools that serve majority low-income students would um, have to share their funds with private schools that potentially serve no low-income students or exclusively wealthy students. Um, so this has a disproportionate impact on um, low-income students and students of color um, who are the majority of, of Title I schools across the country, uh, while white students um, and higher-income students are the majority of private school students across the country. Um, so those are a couple of things that we're watching at the federal level. So we have a question from a listener that I think is kind of related. So see if either of you would like to take a stab at this one. So what sort of private schools are emerging to be recipients of diverted funds, like maybe online schools or what we are seeing popping up in Arizona, micro schools? How are they packaged or what is it that they're doing to try to draw people away from public schools? I think this is especially related to our COVID moment as we're all trying to figure out what it means to be in or not in the classroom now as we're dealing with the pandemic. So any thoughts? on that, either of you? I'm happy to um, chime in with some thoughts and Jessica add yours. But um, yeah, I think, you know, um, we've seen um, certainly uh, there's been great reporting in, in Arizona in particular around some of the kind of fraud and abuse uh, with, with private school voucher funds. Um, and that's been true in some of the, the states uh, where I work, um, you know, where um, uh, uh, private schools are set up in um, kind of strip malls and, um, you know, certainly don't have um, the resources uh, to um, meet students' needs. Um, and I think um, the, the shift to online and supporting online um, private voucher schools only kind of, you can at least see um, these, these private schools that, that pop up, um, but it's a lot easier for, I think, to take advantage of folks who really are desperate to figure out um, uh, you know, distance learning and, and online learning um, to, um, you know, just set up a, a shop um, that, that is inadequate um, in terms of meeting students' needs. Yeah. No, that's, I, I agree. There's always a concern about sort of fly-by-night private schools um, wanting to participate in voucher programs because of the lack of the same standards that apply to public schools in all sorts of areas, academic standards, fiscal accountability, transparency of how they use their funds. Um, and when you talk about online education, those concerns can be exacerbated. Uh, obviously, public schools I and mean, all schools are grappling um, with distance learning right now out of necessity, um, but the proposition that that should be a permanent um, way of educating many, many students um, is, is something else entirely and something that is of concern to those who are fighting um, voucher programs and privatization programs. Yes, thank you. So Jessica, tell us a little bit about, I, we haven't gotten a question about this, but I know we will, so I'm just going to ask it. Uh, many of us have been following the U.S. Supreme Court case, Espinoza versus Montana, and the decision could really show up any day. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what this case is and what the implications are uh, of it? Yes, this is an important case. Um, so I will just start with a little bit about what it's about. 
Um, so in 2018, the Montana Supreme Court invalidated, struck down a state voucher program that provided one of those tax credit voucher programs, a dollar for dollar tax credit for donations to scholarship granting organizations. Uh, and the Montana Supreme Court said that the, that tax credit voucher program violated what's called the no aid provision in the Montana state constitution, which prohibits the use of public funds for, to aid private religious schools in Montana. So the US Supreme Court accepted that case for review and is expected to issue its decision probably sometime this month. And several pro-voucher groups have argued that that Montana no aid provision was motivated by anti-Catholic bigotry and that it violates the religion and equal protection clauses of the US Constitution. Um, so Public Funds Public Schools was one of the groups that filed an amicus brief or a friend of the court brief in the Supreme Court on this issue. And we did that to make two points that we think are really important about this case. The first is to provide some historical context for Montana's constitutional reform process in the 70s, um, which shows clearly that they put that no aid clause in the Constitution, prohibiting the funding of religious schools out of a desire to ensure that the limited state funds for education would stay in public schools because almost basically all private schools then were religious schools in Montana and still most are. Um, and they wanted to keep that money in public schools because they knew it was so important and they knew that funding for public schools was scarce. Um, the other thing that our brief highlights is that peer reviewed research that we've talked about that studies consistently show that voucher programs negatively affect student achievement. Um, and that the research that's cited by voucher proponents, much of it suffers from critical flaws um, in research design and validity. And so that's an important perspective, we think, for the court and for the public to have on vouchers. Um, so what are the possible outcomes of this case? There are many. We hope that the US Supreme Court will uphold the Montana Supreme Court's decision that the voucher program violated the state constitution. If the Supreme Court reverses that decision and goes the other way, then there are a number of different things that they could say about voucher programs or about state constitutions, no aid clauses. Um, so where do we go after this? A lot of it will depend on the specifics of what the US Supreme Court says, but one thing that is really important to note is that whichever way the Supreme Court decides, there are many avenues for challenging vouchers in court, for example, under state constitutions education clauses like we talked about in Nevada, um, in addition to all the other non litigation ways to challenge vouchers. So those um, avenues would not be affected by the Espinosa decision. And PFPS will have analysis when the decision comes out and we'll have follow up materials and programming. Um, so make sure to sign up on our website for our updates uh, and we will be watching for that decision. Oh, thank you so much. You know, you mentioned earlier that you guys did a, your own webinar in ESA vouchers. So I'll just plug that because even though I feel like I know a lot about it, it was really interesting. And so if that's available on your website, I think some of our listeners and volunteers will be interested if they didn't catch it the first time around looking at it. So, so you guys know, and many of our listeners know, that people across the state of Arizona have just worked tireless, tirelessly to make sure our lawmakers prioritize public education. And in spite of the fact that we've been doing this work for these last few years, and in spite of the fact that year after year after year, every poll that's ever done in Arizona shows just incredible widespread support for public education, regardless of political party, regardless of demographic, so many people support public education. And yet, in spite of that fact, our governor, um, just in this legislative session, signed a bill into law that expanded our vouchers once again, even though the voters in 2018 really clearly said, no, we don't want any more voucher expansions by voting no on Prop 305. But he signed a bill into law that allows vouchers, our taxpayer dollars, to go out of our state, to leave our state, to pay for private religious school tuition in schools in other states. So we are always looking for ways to stop vouchers, to slow the growth of vouchers. We've maybe in, in our conversation touched a little bit on this, but Catherine or, or both of you, but maybe we'll start with Catherine, talk a little bit about what's worked in defeating or slowing vouchers or what kind of things we might think about to challenge 
this kind of incremental expansion that seems to just continue happening? Sure, and this is um, something that I think we all think a lot about because it's our, our mission at Public Funds of Public Schools. And as Jessica mentioned when she talked about um, what it is that our campaign does, we use a couple of different strategies. Um, and so the first being um, litigation, and, and we've talked throughout this webinar about um, examples of lawsuits that have resulted in courts declaring voucher programs illegal um, under state constitutions, sometimes under the education clauses, um, uh, or the prohibitions to fund private or religious schools. Um, and Nevada and Tennessee are recent examples of voucher programs um, that have been struck down by, by courts um, that we touched on a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, we, we focus a lot on supporting state legislative advocacy too. Um, and I, I think where we've seen um, uh, advocates be successful in defeating, defeating voucher bills um, it is because of the kind of dedicated advocacy that you all do at SOS Arizona. Um, and it's about really holding lawmakers accountable, um, of course, educating them about um, all of the um, flaws and how vouchers can hurt students um, and public schools. Um, but also, you know, I think um, uh, making noise in, in communities um, where uh, representatives are voting for vouchers and communities are not aware of those decisions. I think um, there is not a lot of support for vouchers um, in the public. And there are sometimes representatives from um, districts that don't even really have private schools um, supporting vouchers because of um, party leadership or, or other, uh, you know, demands. And so I think really, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, that kind of local level advocacy and attention to the impact of decisions being made um, in, you know, by state legislators is really important. Um, I think that there are also some creative things that we've seen um, be successful if you are fighting a voucher program that um, ultimately might end up passing. Um, one is uh, trying to get sunset provisions inserted, uh, meaning that the voucher program won't go on indefinitely. Yet. It will be more of a pilot and at some point um, the legislature will have to consider whether it's been successful. Um, there was a pilot program, an ESA voucher in Mississippi that passed five years ago and just expired. Um, the legislature did ultimately end up renewing um, the voucher program, but because Mississippi had built in requirements for um, analysis of the program and review of how it was doing and had identified a number of flaws, it is a much more scaled back version um, that got renewed. And so I think if you can work to get those two things um, inserted into bills that are moving or to existing programs, um, those are ways that, that we've seen, um, you know, advocacy be able to kind of slow or, or halt um, ultimately voucher programs. I think um, some of the exciting developments over the past year in, in defeats of voucher bills um, have also resulted from some of the public school teacher demonstrations. And I think we're in a moment right now where um, support for educators is pretty high um, with all of the children um, doing, you know, distance learning from home. And so I think um, really, uh, you know, listening to educators and um, to, you know, the, the budget fights that they've um, been waging and, and really the budget cuts that they've been trying to um, teach through without having all the resources that they need um, are, you know, a big part of what we've seen be successful too. Um, and then, you know, we, we work at PSPS to support um, high quality research on the effects of vouchers. We've seen that really be essential to, to make the arguments um, that we make because they're based on you know, research and evidence of um, outcomes for vouchers. Um, we've also seen investigative journalism, I think, be really important. And so that's another um, thing I would plug is working with local journalists um, to study your voucher programs. Um, we've seen um, pieces in Louisiana that really highlight how well voucher programs perform if they were held to the same grading standards as uh, the public schools in that state. Um, we've seen some really good reporting out of Arizona that I mentioned, too, around um, fraud and abuse. Um, just last week, Covington Post published a piece um, that found that millions of our public dollars in Florida 
um, go to private schools that push conversion therapy on LGBTQ students. Um, and so I think um, in the absence of accountability by a state, um, that kind of investigative journalism becomes really critical to, to um, demonstrating the, the negative impacts of vouchers um, where a state won't, won't do that. Um, and finally, I think, um, you know, we've seen some work around message reframing um, that I think is important. Um, you know, this freedom and school choice narrative that we see from the administration and from others um, is, you know, I think there have been um, some, uh, some inspiring attempts to kind of reframe who, whose choice it is, right, because it is ultimately the private school's choice. Um, based on application criteria, which can be about students' academics or behavior or their identity even, um, but also cost um, above and beyond a voucher and um, resources like transportation. Um, so Journey for Justice, for example, is a national network of grassroots organizers that has a We Choose campaign um, calling for what they say is, you know, real equity and not the illusion of school choice. Um, and so I think uh, helping to reclaim some of that messaging and, and push back on, on messaging um, from voucher proponents is another important um, strategy. We actually have um, G2 Brown from Journey for Justice is going to be one of our guests in a few weeks um, on one of our next speaking of schools conversations. So we're really excited about that. And then I also wanted to, to give to a shout the date. out to mentioned Mississippi. Um, the Parents Campaign in Mississippi is a small uh, grassroots organization and we reached out to them early on and they've been so kind to us and helping us kind of understand the whole landscape and the work that they've done. So they, they have been- They do great work. Along, yeah, and doing such good work in Mississippi. So that's, that's really good to hear. So, okay, we have, well, let me just ask one other, uh, quick question about um, ways to fight vouchers, because I think in Arizona that that has been really important to us. And so a couple of things I'd like to highlight about what you said, we, we were surprised naively so that our legislators in Arizona who live in rural communities or communities where not a single one of their constituents could even use a voucher would vote for legislation that would take money out of our public schools. And so it's one of the things that Save Our Schools has tried to do is to have conversations like we're having with you guys. We do a road show that of course we're doing um, webinars. We used to actually go on the road and do road shows in the pre-pandemic days. But I think really helping constituents, just individual people understand the importance of that school that's right there in their neighborhood and making sure that they can find a voice and letting their representatives know how important that is and how important public school is to them. I think that's just absolutely critical. And sometimes people think, oh, you know, I'm just one person, like one voice doesn't matter, but it really, really does matter. And so I think just having those conversations, um, we love to have conversations that save our schools, just, you know, one one on one, standing in the line at the grocery store. We can't even do that anymore, I guess, in our in our pandemic world. But really, just helping six people feet apart with a mask. Yeah, yeah. Um, just helping people understand why this stuff is happening, and how we can have a voice in making sure our legislators and our country prioritizes public education and recognizes public education as a cornerstone of American democracy. So that is so important to us. So I appreciate you gave some great um, examples of sunset provisions, messaging, all of that I think is so, so important. So thank you for all of that. Now, Jessica, will you tell us a little bit about uh, the resources that PFPS has on your website that people might be interested in? And then we do have a few questions coming in from our listeners. And for those of you who are listening, it's not too late to put your questions in the comments and the people working tech behind the scenes will send those along to me and I'll do my best to, to ask our panelists or at least combine several of the questions and see if we can get through some of them. So Jessica, tell us about the resources that you guys have that we ha can have access to. Sure, um, and one of our most important goals, as we've mentioned, is to support other organizations 
national, state, and local. And as you've mentioned, there are many grassroots and local organizations who are working on these same issues alongside us. And so we want to support them and individuals, as you said, having these conversations um, and understanding the negative effects and the harms of vouchers um, is one of the most important things that we can all support. So, and, and to that end, we have a webinar on our website now um, by Professor Julie Mead talking about why public education is the cornerstone of our democracy and helping to, helping to frame that and helping to um, tease out those ideas of why it's so important. So I encourage everybody to watch that. Our website is pfps.org. Uh, I'll put up a slide with that at the end of the webinar, but pfps.org. And if you go to our contact page, you can sign up for our um, email blast, which will tell you when we have a new resource or a new event. Um, so let me just tell you about a couple of the resources that are on the website. For legislative work, uh, we now have a bill tracker where we're gathering and monitoring proposed voucher legislation in all 50 states and the US Congress. So you, if you go to bill tracker at the top of the website, you can search by state, you can search by type of voucher bill and get a whole lot of information on bill content and the status of those different legislative proposals. Um, on our advocacy page, we have resources uh, including legislative analysis, like of the 2019 session, so you can see all the different ways that voucher proposals were defeated. We also have policy briefs there, for example, one on Mississippi, um, and fact sheets. Right now we have a fact sheet summarizing the research on the negative effects of vouchers, um, and we will have <laughs> excuse me, more fact sheets coming out in the coming weeks, um, as well as there are recordings of our webinars. And as that series continues, we'll have more of those recordings. Um, on our research page, as Catherine mentioned, our research, research page has a wealth of information, summaries of all of those studies um, and other policy briefs and uh, from the government, from think tanks, and also short summaries and then links to the full studies. So you can have that information at your fingertips when you're doing your own advocacy. And for those who are interested in litigation, our litigation page has a list and a summary of every voucher decision that's been handed down by courts across the country, as well as information and court documents on PFPS litigation, like the Tennessee litigation that we're involved in, and examples of amicus briefs. Um, so visit our website for all of that, and please feel free to also email us um, PFPS or to email Catherine or me, um, and we'll be happy to try to get you those resources. And um, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see that information too. And as Jessica is sharing her screen, I will just say that one of the hats I wear for Save Our Schools is Director of Research, and I was trying to keep track of all the bills across the country related to vouchers. So I am so grateful to you guys, not only for doing that, but for putting it together in a way where it's so easy to access so much information. It's just incredibly helpful. So yeah, that's great. So. It's Very nice to hear that and the continued sort of morphing of um, what, you know, what voucher proposals come out makes it difficult to track, right? There's, um, there are constantly new names and search terms and the like, but. Yeah. So we do have a question. I'm curious to see if you guys have an answer for this um, or just like what your comments would be. So one of our listeners or viewers asks, do we know how often or at what rate parents leave voucher programs once they discover that private schools can reject them, deny services to their kids, or increase the price tag uh, at any time? And once they realize how un inconvenient and unrealistic it is to use a voucher, especially for working or lower income families, here in Arizona, this viewer knows dozens of parents who've tried ESAs and then quit and return to public schools once they've realized just how much of a scam it is and not just a magic bullet solution. So have there been studies that look at the number of people who leave voucher programs or return to public schools? I don't know of a study that tracks that and, and the person who asked the question has named a lot of the reasons that we also hear for families leaving voucher programs um, the price exceeds or there were hidden costs that they can't cover or their child needs particular services and their rights to those services aren't protected in the private school lots of different reasons. I don't know of a study that tracks that um, and part of 
part of what hinders having more studies on voucher programs in general um, is the lack of requirement to report information about them in legislation, for example. So um, it's important uh, that we try to get more of that data so that there can be more high quality studies on that. Yeah. One um, example I would know is, I, yeah, I think that's true. I think we um, don't have a holistic picture of, um, you know, all of the reason, all of the um, students who are leaving private school vouchers for various reasons and what those reasons are. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Mississippi um, ESA voucher, which is a, a voucher specifically for students with disabilities, um, had a requirement in the legislation for the legislature to study the program upon implementation. And one of the things that it found was that of parents awarded vouchers for their children, um, a third of those parents ultimately could not find a private school to meet their child's needs um, or a private school to accept them. They refused to admit um, voucher students with those needs. And so um, that gives a sense of, um, in Mississippi, uh, the difficulty of, of finding a school that will do all of the things that public schools are required to do for students. Um, but I, I don't think that um, we, we really have a full picture like your, um, like the participant asked. Yeah, and that's definitely true in Arizona. There's so little accountability or transparency for what happens with the money when it's you know, put on a debit card, which is what happens in Arizona and given to the parents or how the child does academically. We just know so little about what happens. So we have another question that is really interesting. I think it kind of comes at all of this from a different angle. And this person asks, what can we do to improve our schools so that parents don't feel the need to remove their students? Current discipline strategies at public schools unfairly target special needs and, min and minority students and classrooms are overcrowded. So I'll, I'll take a first stab at that just because I know this is a tremendous issue in Arizona because we have the second most crowded class sizes in the country. We have the highest student to counselor ratio in the country. So in Arizona, it's about one counselor for every 920 students. The recommended ratio is one to every 250. And so I think it is, it is a very valid point that our listener is making about discipline strategies, about the pressures that our teachers are under and the lack of support that they have when they're in the classroom because they can't call in a counselor because if they even have one, it might be a counselor who's splitting his or her time across three, four or five different schools in the district. And so um, it just makes it very difficult. And as a teacher myself, I get really angry when people say, oh, it's just a few more kids. As if adding, you know, just, just five more kids into your fourth grade class or your third grade class isn't gonna be that big of a deal. I think for anyone who's been in a classroom with kids, especially kids with special needs, especially kids who are dealing with active trauma in their homes. You know, it is so much stuff that goes on in our classrooms in addition to academics. And to, ju to just put a few more kids in a classroom is, is just not good for the kids, not good for the teachers, and makes those teaching um, situations very, very challenging and difficult. So do you guys have thoughts on that? what schools can sure. do to um, Yes, thanks. That's a great question and a great point. Um, and I could just start out, Catherine. Um, the project of strengthening our public schools is continuous. Um, and we are, our individual organizations and PFPS deeply devoted to addressing the challenges that many students face in public schools. Um, and, and those exist uh, and there is ongoing work to make sure that all students get an adequate, equitable education and that their rights are fulfilled in public schools. One very important point and that we can all work toward and as part of Public Funds Public Schools mission is having adequate resources um, because so many of these challenges come back to adequate funding and resources for our public schools. So making sure um, that they are adequately funded is fundamental to addressing all of that. 
Yeah, I'll just affirm what Jessica said. I mean, I think it's a great question because although our campaign is, um, our strategies are around fighting vouchers, I think ultimately, you know, our, our goal is to ensure that there is a thriving public school in every community um, that meets the students' needs in that community. And I think one of the, um, you know, really beautiful things about public schools is that um, they, you know, can and should be shaped and led by their communities. Um, and so when we see public schools uh, get all of the resources that they need and, um, you know, um, operate in, in that sort of democratic way, um, you know, I think that it's a system that can work for communities and um, is structured in a way that, um, you know, can, can really uh, be shaped to benefit and serve, um, you know, the, the students in a community um, in whatever way, um, you know, they see fit. And so I think, um, you know, our, our strategy is to ensure that this system that we have in place that um, really can be successful in, in many places is, um, is successful for every kid. Um, and you don't get there until you, um, you know, resource our schools. And, and for us, you know, a strategy to get there is to stop this diversion of public funds um, to private schools. Yeah. Well, thank you both. I want to just say a big thank you to Jessica Levin, who is from Public Funds for Public Schools and the Education Law Center, and Catherine Dunn from the Southern Poverty Law Center. So I really appreciate you guys being here and letting us pick your brains a little bit, get your insights, and for all that you do um, to really push to create strong public schools across the United States and all of the help that you guys have given and will continue to give us working on the ground in the States and Arizona. We are very, very grateful. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you and likewise. Fun chatting with you. Thank you.